And hello everybody, welcome again to uh, One of My Podcast, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome this week uh, the wonderful Christina Finseth onto uh, the show. For those of you watching on YouTube, um, hello. For those of you listening, uh, a virtual uh, hello. Say hello, Christina. Hello. Good to have you here. So Christina describes herself as, and I'm just reading from your LinkedIn profile, a growth marketing lead at um, Interstellar, we'll come to that in a minute, helping teams build predictable client and candidate pipeline with the outbound fire framework, I love avocados. We'll come to avocados at the um, uh, at the end. Um, now I bumped into Christina via um, Justin Michael. We're now in some crazy Discord, insane chats around. Um, helping each other learn the best tactics for all types of cold um, outreach, be it phone, be it email, be it um, social, be it carrier pigeon, be it what have you. And I've been fascinated to watch Christina's and learn Christina's story around, around actually email and how to do this properly, but also at um, scale. So what we're going to cover off today is a bit of Christina's story. The good, the bad, the ugly around kind of email marketing, email prospecting, whatever you want to call it. Um, what you're seeing, Christina, and then we'll talk around um, the framework that you have created on uh, on Teachable that people can uh, sign up to and uh, learn. But enough about me. So your story, Christina. Who are you? What are you? What's the deal? Yeah. So I've had an interesting kind of trajectory in my career, um, which I think has led me to this point and why we're kind of having a conversation around, you know, email outreach. Uh, so I spent the first five, six years of my career actually as a recruiting practitioner. Okay. So a lot of people don't know that, but it really plays into where I'm at now, which is more on the HR tech recruitment tech side, yep. um, working for and selling to people who I used to fill the role. So. Um, I spent that first five to six years in recruiting. I then made a transition into marketing uh, on the dark side, the vendor side um, is what I call it. And you know, it's been kind of history from there. So I've spent the majority of the last five, six years in marketing uh, mm -hmm. from content marketing all the way to full stack marketing. Um, and I did about a year long experiment in sales over the last 12 months before I decided to pivot and go into growth marketing where now I own all of the demand gen, you know, top of funnel um, processes from the marketing and the business development side. So. Okay. Cool. So being a for ex recruiter myself as well in the in the UK, you, you have um, carried a bag. So you've been out there, you've done the hard yards, you've done the, the smile and dial, you don't get your seat back until you've made X number of, of, of appointments. Um, which I think is an interesting kind of, there's a big debate in the moment around the alignment of sell, sales and marketing and how they now need to come hand in glove. And certainly historically, um, I used to talk to the marketing department, you're the coloring in department, and uh, you're there to make it, look, uh, make it look pretty. You may well have said the same when you were um, in a sales role. And the fact that you've actually walked the walk in terms of what a seller has to go through I think it's such a it's such a great kind of knowledge and insight to then bring into uh, the world of um, marketing and um, growth marketing. Can we just unpack growth marketing a bit? Because what is that actually? <laughs> There's marketing, digital marketing, then we have growth marketing. What's growth? What's growth marketing actually mean? Yeah, it's interesting because it's somewhat newer, um, at least in terms of you know the SaaS world really adopting growth marketers in house. Mm -hmm. um, and this could look different at multiple orgs. So for example, I have a friend who heads up growth marketing for Vidyard yep. and his whole process is to drive people to the freemium model because that is their lead gen funnel. Yep. Um, for me, it's a little bit different. I'm owning business development. So now that's kind of broken off of, you know, the, the bulk of that being on the AE plate. Now I've kind of filled out the process and I help to make sure that everyone's enabled to run that framework, right? And run that process. Uh, and I'm the one that's kind of doing the back end analytical piece. But then there's also this whole marketing component. So again, that can look different in many organizations. It could be as simple as all of the demand gen efforts, mm -hmm. but I'm actually running all the way through what we would call the pirate metrics in growth yeah. marketing. Okay. Um, R is what it sounds like, which is why they call it uh, pirate metrics, but it goes all the way through the, the entire customer journey, all the way through like, you know, retention. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of activities that fall in on the marketing side. And so it's really this trifecta of working really closely with customer success yeah. 
and with sales and making sure we're all aligned. Awesome. And I've never heard that's a new one of me. The, 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 the pirate metrics because it's the R metrics. Okay. Um, <laughs> intriguing. So let's let's talk to, to that. And we're going already off piece already, but that's why I do what no, I do with their okay. own framework. We'll come back. It's all right. So what are the what are the R <laughs> metrics then? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and, and the reason it, it, it's like that is because um, the acronym, mm -hmm. if you were to say it out loud without saying the letters, it really is like R. Okay. Um, and so what that focuses on is awareness, yeah. acquisition, yeah. activation, mm -hmm. revenue, retention, and referral. Mm -hmm. And so basically growth marketing can impact tremendously on all of those areas of the business. And so that's where I'm kind of working my way. So being that I'm only, you know, a couple months into this newly created role here, mm -hmm. uh, really where I'm kind of focusing on right now are those two top pieces, awareness and acquisition. Okay. Awesome. And then kind of and working you know, my way down the funnel. You know, yeah. Well, I'm going to have to check after this. I'm going to have to go into, we have to go, you know, you have to share that with me on Discord. And I want to look at that further because how you just talk that through, that resonates with, I think that's gonna work on any, no matter what you're selling product or service, that kind of process is exactly the same, right? In terms of what you're trying to, um, what you're trying to uh, to achieve. So let's bring it back into kind of what we were, were talking about. So cold outreach on email, primarily. And as a recipient throughout my life of marketing, inverted commas, um, emails, from both consumer, but you know, more so in uh, in business to business as well, it doesn't have that good a reputation because you might, you just get poorly thought out, poorly crafted, poorly timed, just generally completely irrelevant um, outreach in terms of what the the proponent is, and we're in this discuss this strange world now in terms of um, data privacy and privacy and oh my god do I want to give my email address because if I give my email address I know I'm going to be bombarded with stuff that I don't want you know get people actually I know people have kept completely just dummy accounts to use that email just to get the downloads of whatever it is is they want because you know email marketing in the rounds just isn't in that place and then you get the stats thrown at you that yeah but we get like a 10 percent open rate and a five percent click-through rate and a 0.5 percent someone actually doing something right and my argument is okay if i have that um conversion rate in a sales role i'd be fired yet we're getting i dare i say it's from the um, marketing automation platform to kind of peddling but this is this is a good kind of number so what are you seeing differently? You mentioned this experience, or what have you seen develop over the course of the, you know, how long you've been, you mentioned the last couple of years you've been in this, to where we are today, and more importantly then, what the leaders of organizations, and I would, I would suggest this is as much needs to be at the board as it does, you know, down into the marketing, sales, and so on, what do they need to be thinking about to do things differently? Yeah, well, first and foremost, I want to just put a disclaimer out there that there is no one size fits all strategy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think the biggest thing that people need to be focusing on right now is taking in what's working for multiple people, yeah. running tests and experiments on small segments, and really building out your own framework that involves the components that are moving the needle for you. Um, what I hate, Alex, is these baseline numbers of what people say in the industry is acceptable, right? Oh, if you have at least, you know, 30% opens, if you have at least like a 5% reply rate um, and a one to 2% booked meeting conversion, you're doing great. Anything above that is awesome. And I think we're setting the bar way too low, yeah. quite frankly. Um, and I think one of the hardest switches for me going from kind of a marketing one to many nurture email type of campaign mm -hmm. to a sales role was really starting to hyper focus on okay do i want to send 300 really well thought out templated messages that i know are going to probably move the needle at some point and get let's just say a 50 percent plus open rate mm -hmm. a 
10% plus reply rate and a one to 2% booked meeting conversion yeah. over a two week period, right? And that's respectable. Yeah. I would say that's probably what we would consider a marketing, mm -hmm. on the marketing side, a really well performing campaign. Yeah. Or would I rather spend maybe a little extra time on the quality factor? And by quality, I mean researching and really finding some things to either A, build relevancy, or B, pull heartstrings. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And build 40 messages in the course of a day that end up converting 80% plus open, 30% plus reply rate, and 10 to 20% booked meeting rate in three days. Uh, That's I know a big what switch. I would take. <laughs> yeah, I, I know yeah. what I would take. Um, but if we just if we just kind of pause there then for that because you, you raise an interesting point around kind of one the one to many versus the one to few I guess from a sales perspective and this and I believe this is where this whole conversation with sales and marketing need to need to align is that marketing historically have been driven by kind of volume metrics and they then present that to leadership and they go hey but we sent out a thousand emails, we sent you know, we click send and a thousand emails were sent out, but it's not our fault that either they do bounce rates or open rates or this, that's sales fault because the data's wrong or the data's wrong with CRM. Or they then go, hey, but this post got like a million impressions and leadership do what million impressions, that sounds good, not even knowing what an, impre what an impression um, is and all, all, all this kind of stuff because it's kind of, we've done our bit, it's sales fault if they can't you know uh, qualify or convert the the, the mql as a marketing qualified leads flip side is then sales blame marketing going well all the leads are crap because they're not relevant to us because it's not like not the right segment not the right person not the right level and and so on so what have you seen in your world that starts to kind of because you've been across everything and what to change this this conversation because that sounds that's a real shift in the thought process of a marketeer, the thought process of a salesperson, the reason I say this from a salesperson perspective is that too often do I see online conversations, I don't want my sales reps wasting time doing research when they could be just doing you know, the, the smile and dance. And if you haven't got a, um, a connect and sell type set up like um, our friend Jerry is that's kind of pushing through, then I kind of get why a salesperson or a sales leader where they're driven by calls and connects doesn't want somebody spending extra time doing research on social that can be time spent elsewhere yeah well and i think there's there's a couple of different things that i have um to say about that one is and i have a sticky note right by my desk right now and it says drive revenue not mql and so I think as marketers, what's happened, and it really comes from the top down and you know, your marketing leadership, your um, executive leadership, et cetera. Um, if the goal is to drive as many people into the funnel as possible, then what happens is as marketers, they get blurred by that, right? It's more of a volume game at that point. And then, you know, okay, cool. Maybe the SDRs or BDRs, whatever you call them in your org, have yep. to run through a hundred people to find, you know, 20 that are really quality. Yep. Um, but hey, we did our job because that's what we're, we're, we're measured yep. on as success. What I think is really important is in the org, I think of everything on the marketing side through the lens of, will this get us closer to our revenue goal? Mm -hmm. so as, Which as, sounds horrible. Well, it doesn't yeah. because, it, it, I mean, I, I don't think, and I think that and this is kind of an interesting thing. I, I, for me, it doesn't sound horrible, but I'm a salesman through and through and through. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's, it's all about revenue. I mean, ignore yep. profitability and cost of sale and all that kind of stuff. It, it is revenue. Money is not a dirty word in the right, in the right context. But I agree with you, especially in the last kind of six months and the weirdness of the, the pandemic in terms of should we be selling, not be selling, and blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, I've seen some really like, bad attempts at trying to humanize the situation that we, that we are in. But I, I don't think there's any, I believe that marketing should 100% be accountable to some extent to helping revenue. And the salespeople need to be accountable in terms of helping marketing understand what needs to happen to get to that first touch point. Um, you know, to quote you, getting that ticket to a conversation. The two start talking to each other internally and start to 
you help me achieve this and I help you achieve that, then the end result is we're getting to where we're trying to get to, which is that number, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I, and I get the point of, you know, when you have a new SDR coming into the seat, there's something to be said about letting them drink from the fire hose and yeah. getting as much experience and comfort um, in how they're talking to prospects, what they're hearing from prospects, and just really feeling comfortable with that. But I think, and what I'm trying to empower people to do is go back to their manager and say, I know that we have activity-based goals, which that's a whole nother conversation we can talk about another time, Alex. But I know I have to do X amount of activity, but can I spend the next week, two yeah. weeks, testing out this process that's a quality process and report back to you on data? And if it's not producing the right results from that test, then okay, great. I'll go back to some of the activity stuff. But I really think that this quality side of researching and really being thoughtful in your outreach, if it's going to convert higher, then you don't have to make 100 calls. Yeah. And I don't make cold calls. I don't make cold calls for a reason because I found the framework that works for me and our team here at Interstellar. Mm -hmm. We don't need to. And it doesn't matter that we're selling a cold email outreach tool. Yeah, okay, we're, we're eating our own dog food. But at the same token, we haven't needed to pick up the phone because we're converting at a really high rate off of email alone. And so I think, you know, again, it might be a combined strategy for some people. Um, and in some industries, maybe volume works for you, but yeah. I really think people need to think about the fact that email is not truly free. It's not free. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So my CEO drills this all the time. Email, people think you can just go and send a thousand emails tomorrow, right? And it's free. We're not paying for it. But what you are paying for is in deliverability issues, which also can take four to six weeks, sometimes longer to recover and bounce back from. Right. It's not free. And so I think more people just need to be educated on what goes into having a well-performing email system. And that means warming up your email, Mm -hmm. making sure that you're not sending the same templates that everyone on the internet is sending to because you already are hurting your deliverability. I mean, there's just so much we can go into on best yeah, practices yeah. there, but yeah, um, it's not free. Okay. It that's does cost you some things. Yeah, that's that. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's actually the, the system, you know, of course it's not free because the system itself costs money to have the system, let alone everything else, the time and the effort, the marketing materials, the marketing costs um, behind that. But it's like everything else. We, we see the mobile phone as well, which is part of what we do. Would you ask a, a rep for the ROI of the cost of their mobile phone, their cell phone? Well, no. Well, maybe we, you know, we should do the same with their, their laptop, et cetera, et cetera. So you said you've been running an experiment for the last uh, 12 months and um, without kind of giving away the, 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 the key secrets, um, and we'll come on to that. What sort of things have you been um, doing to get to the point that's now led you to building out your outbound fire framework, but also giving you enough data? And that's the key thing in all of this, the yeah. data to go. I know for a fact, disclaimer, one size does not fit all, but based on you know tried and tested methodology, this kind of approach doesn't work this kind of approach does work so let, let's you know talk, talk us through that yeah so first and foremost again there's been a lot of experimentation that led to this point right um i've ran i can't even probably put a number on the amount of experiments i've run and the types of messaging that i've tested against the market and what I found is really interesting. Um, and maybe this is kind of uh, serendipitous with everything that happened with COVID, mm -hmm. but people don't need to say anything about their product, their service, the problem or the solution in any of their outreach. And I think that's hard for us. And, it, and I'm gonna say us because I've been in the sales shoes. Us as salespeople to accept because, you know, a lot of us are, trained or at least have this understanding that if I'm reaching out to you today, Alex, that I need to tell you why I'm reaching out and who I am and pack as much as I can in that email so that you know, like, I'm not just reaching out to you for, uh, quite frankly, shits and giggles, right? Yeah. I'm reaching out to you because I have a product or a service or I've worked with companies like yours. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do that. What I have found and the data shows this mm -hmm. is that if you have a compelling enough message, and by compelling, 
it doesn't need to be anything about what you're doing. It could be about something you posted on the internet about, I don't know, Subarus. I love my Subaru, so that was the top of mind for me. But it could be about anything that might be relevant to you as a person, right? Because we're B to H, not B to C, B to B, et cetera, B to H. Mm -hmm. You will do your research. You will look at who I am. You're going to click on the website and my signature, gather some context, and then you're going to respond to me through that lens. Okay. And I know this because of the data. Right. Yeah. Most of the replies that I get all did their research before they replied and they already know why I'm reaching out without me having to spell it out for them. Okay, interesting. So this is so this is the, the recipient of your cow your cold outreach. Yeah. Based on what you said in that initial outreach, mm-hmm. they have done that they've that's driven them to do their own research on you and the, the company um, uh, Interstellar yep. to know why you are reaching out. Okay, that's that kind of flips everything on its head a little bit. Totally. <laughs> I know it's hard to, it's really hard to wrap around. And I'm always happy to share too if you want me to share my screen and just show some of this. But yeah, it, it's pretty strongly correlated between the people who are clicking on your website and doing their own kind of. And again, you're giving them the controls to make that decision. You know, I get the email. I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, this is actually a really nice message. It seems thoughtful. It has nothing to do with anything, but it's really, really thoughtful. Let me see. What does Alex do? Oh, what's his company do? Okay, cool. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it's like this buyer journey. People like to be selective in their own process. So, um, I'd love for you to share my screen with that. You share your screen with that won't help us in terms of the listeners on the podcast because they can't see things. They won't be able to <laughs> see it. Yes. <laughs> could, could, we, could we then put out technology, right? Some people prefer to listen. Some people like to uh, like to watch. Yes, of course. So can and again, I appreciate this is you know one, one size does not fit fit all, but that's a really interesting. I'm trying to wrap my again. That's already challenging my thought process because somebody's done the research on you based on you reached out to them by not actually saying. I remember you talking about this in your intro video um, to your uh, your course. That you have to say anything about your product, your service, your kind of the why. So, what? Mm-hmm. Again, this comes down to authenticity. Because again, I think I've received emails, or I believe I received emails where people have tried to take that approach, but it's just been really bad in terms of yeah, I, I get what you're doing here, but I don't really believe it because this feels kind of fake. So what? What sort of things do you encourage people to kind of pick up on as a genuine you know, business to human outreach, which kind of yep. keeps that balance? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think this has also kind of evolved over the last six months for me personally and our team. Uh, you know, I'm taking out things that are unnecessary, yeah. like hope you're doing well okay. or hope your family is uh you and your family are weathering the storm you know i think people are kind of over that right now we've all adapted and uh COVID is just in the background so i think you know some of the things that i've been doing is i follow basically what i would call a building block template especially on the first outreach where you have a couple of elements that you plug and play and then you still have to tie everything in a pretty bow at the end and so i'll kind of give you an example here especially for those who are listening um, what I'll do is the first sentence is, I noticed that you recently posted about X, Y, Z on LinkedIn yep. and thought I would reach out. So whether it's an article they curated, doesn't matter. Yep. Your comment, and then I quote something that's interesting from that, mm-hmm. was right on the money and I couldn't agree more. Okay. That's it, right? So that's, there's the personalization. It's different every time. So your deliverability is going to be better yeah. because you're not using that same template and dr- drilling at home. Mm-hmm. What I then do is I say, with that said, and I do prompt for a call, just to be very clear. I know there's a lot of uh, critics out there that they don't prompt for a call. I do, but mm-hmm. I think it's about the way you do it. I say, I'd love to get on a call with you for about 10 to 15 minutes to learn about you and then company name and your focus areas right now. I'd love to earn the right to talk through how Interstellar might fit in. 
Okay, I like that. I like the earn, I like I like the earn, the earn to write bit. It takes me back, more, you know, way back when in my sales training when the relationship and which I've seen this being talked about recently. It's like having a bank account. You got to put money yep. in the bank account to then be able to take money out of the bank account. And that's the same if you go straight for the ask, and there's no there's no, there's no money in the bank account to withdraw, then you're not going to get them the ask. So I like that turn of phrase in terms of earning the right to um, you know have have that conversation with you. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, a couple of my friends say this all the time, it's about making deposits, yep. right? Um, and no, not withdrawals. And so, you know, what the rest of my cadence kind of looks like, because I do think there's a science and an art to outreach. So mm -hmm. art is being creative within that parameter. But I think, you know, I'm where I'm very meticulous is about the steps and the day that I'm doing each of those steps. They have to be on point because here's the thing. What's going to happen is if I'm running a process mm -hmm. and then the AEs are running the process, but then they're skipping a day or yeah. things like that, it's really hard to find that data to show that, yes, this is a repeatable process across the entire org. So it's really important to follow the same kind of cadence as you're testing that out. But the rest of the steps in that cadence are all gives. Okay. Yeah. That's it. There's no hard selling whatsoever. Um, and there are LinkedIn touch points along the way, including voice messages and things like that. Yeah. So it's not strictly all cold email outreach, but that's really the the uh, focus point and the highlight of the entire cadence. And in terms of kind of cadences, and that's something which is alien to, to my world, professional services and law firm marketing and yeah. account marketing and counting marketing and kind of selling. But I believe that they can learn from it because there is an ideal customer profile they have. They they won't have it because they don't record CRM data very well. Um, and then let alone having an interseller equivalent or an outreach or a gong or a lead feeder or, or whoever to, to record this. But is that I take it, I'm going to make an assumption here that in order to be able to get those cadences, which you do know that don't work and do work and don't work, you need a piece of technology platform to help drive that and of course you actually need the human beings to recall that this went out at that time this is the process this is the, this is the time lag between touch point one two three four five six whatever and then how that touch point is via email call social voice note video notes etc yeah i mean it's always helpful to have systems in place to record all this and keep yourself in check the thing that I also preach is that you could really run this with any system. You could do this manually off spreadsheets if you really wanted to. Yeah. It's obviously going to be easier if you're empowered by tech, right? It's out there. Um, but yeah, it's important to keep yourself completely on track. And then once you find what you believe to be your, your A, mm -hmm. right? Now you've got this cadence. It seems like it's working. You've gotten meetings out of it. Um, you've ran it on at least 50, you know, high, high level prospects. Um, then you can start uh, testing that, you know, A-B yeah. testing. People think that you're just constantly testing two different things, but you should always have kind of your A yeah. and test against that. And mm -hmm. then as that evolves, make changes to your process as new things come into play. I'm always evaluating that. And normally on a quarterly basis, I start to revamp messaging, yeah. take a look at the steps again, see what maybe we could do a little differently. And that's things like having one email which says, hope you're weathering the storm, another email, not having that statement or a variation of then just seeing, does that, taking that out then impact the open rate or reply rate or book meeting rate, yeah? Yeah, or, um, you know, just even like what your, your ask at the end, right? What does your call to action look like? Are you asking an open-ended question? Do you yeah. want to test that against more of the like prompt for a call? Mm -hmm. um, what makes sense, right? And so I think once you have that A kind of at least mostly figured out it makes it easier for you to test long term yeah. but again you can run this as a manual process it would be a little painful just thinking about uh, yeah. thinking about it but um <laughs> and you <laughs> well and the other thing is like you don't have to build your own collateral for the gives either so if you know you have people who are listening to this right now who are like oh i don't have like an ebook i don't have yeah. things to give that i think would be relevant to my audience curate thought leaders who would be relevant. And so that's what I do. I infuse other people because quite frankly, content from other people that they respect 
is gonna fare way better than if you attach your one pager or you leak to like an ebook that you guys wrote, right? I'm preaching, preaching to the converted on that one from what I'm talking about from a social perspective. Just if you just broadcast yeah. corporate content on social, no one's gonna engage actually leverage third party content from influencers or thought yep. leaders and I'm carefully using the word influencers because they then think like you know Instagram influencers but people that are respected in their industry and then if you can yep. somehow tie it back to what you do or what they can learn from that etc cetera, etc cetera, that's way more powerful and to another point other than time that you need to invest to go and find that then you know, Google alerts as <laughs> for God's sake um, or if you have a sales navigator it's just super easy for that to curate that content for you um, it's all out there, right? That content already um, uh, already exists. And are there, in terms of your testing, there's always another one I'm seeing you know, debate on you know, our, our channels within Discord and so on, but on, on other, uh, other channels. Um, the best, and I get these emails on a daily basis, but what the best, you know, the, the subject line is in terms of get, getting that open rate. And I do recognize that you, know, you have a specific product selling to a specific market. But are there some do's and don'ts around that? Yeah, so what I've found, and again, I've tested tons of subject lines. Mm -hmm. um, first name in the subject line already gets your open rates up. Okay. Uh, keeping it under, keeping your subject line under, I believe it's 40 characters, yep. 25 to 40 characters, so that it doesn't get cut off on mobile, right? Yeah. Um, and, and really what I found, these are the most, the best performing ones that I've had personally. I'll do something like Alex about your LinkedIn post. Yeah. Alex, um, I disagree with so-and-so's post too. Maybe they commented on something. Yeah. Um, or just something simple like Alex, let's chat. Okay. Or Alex, let's connect. Something very, very simple, but keeping that first name in there. Don't worry about needing to say, uh, convert 10% of yeah. blah, 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 right? You don't need to say anything like that, like that in the subject line. Remember, um, the components of your email and the components of your sequence should all be thought of through the frame of what's the goal for this. Mm -hmm. And so you have it uh, here, your ticket to a conversation. When I'm doing a subject line, I'm thinking in terms of, okay, what's gonna get them to open? Yeah. In the body of the text, it's okay, what's gonna get them to do their research and respond, right? And engage with me. Um, we don't wanna be thinking of that as like, again, jam packing with all this stuff about who you are, what you do, yeah. why they could benefit. Are we thinking about the sell already? It's in the back of our mind, but yeah. you're not gonna get there with that first email. That's not the goal, right? And if it is, and it happens, cool, that's exciting, but it should really be thought of in that frame. And do you on the, so it's interesting because if I, and I just because I get so many of them, the, the last two examples that you gave me of Alex Let's Connect or Alex Let's Chat, for me, I'd probably not, I, I might open it, I might not, but if you reference a LinkedIn post, because in my world, it's guaranteed to go open, 100% yep. in terms of uh, in terms of what's what. But with, when you're when you're referencing a social media post, so I guess it could be LinkedIn, it could be Twitter, it could be Insta, Insta wherever, it doesn't really yeah. matter. Um, do you put a link to, do you put a link to their their post? No. But the reason that was said, no. well, my mind is working. If I put a link to their post, then they may click on the link, which they may guide them to look at my profile. Then if if they've looked at my profile, I know that they've done, they've opened the email, and they've then done more from an engagement perspective. Um, so why would you, why do you not put the link in? Is that to save time, or is it something you just don't do? Well, because again, you're referencing their own posts. Yeah. Like there's no, in, in my opinion, unless you're trying to get them to look at something that might be useful to them, yeah. I usually err on the side of not including okay. that many links. Um, and again, you're spelling out in the first two sentences exactly which post it is. So like in your case or anyone else's case, who maybe posts a lot, right? Like Justin Michael, if I was gonna call him out and do this, <laughs> do this process for him, um, he'll know in those first two sentences exactly which post it is, oh, yeah. right? Without me having to link it. But I get your point on trying to take them on a journey. But the last thing you want to happen is they're on your email, they click that link, yeah, and maybe. then they get sucked into the LinkedIn hole, and yeah, then they've just like lost that traction yeah. from your email. So get them to read it, and then they'll engage in some form or fashion, you know, yeah. with your website, whatever. No, that's, a, that's a, a, a valid point. I hadn't even thought about that. They get onto LinkedIn and suddenly they're, they're in the social media world and they're, they're, you, you're distracted from what you're trying to um, 
uh, trying to uh, to achieve. And then in terms of hand yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> One more point that I want to make because I found this out the hard way. So anyone who's listening who's going to follow the approach of using someone's LinkedIn post to start a conversation, make sure that you either like or do something with that LinkedIn post um, because the last thing you want is to write this really thoughtful email about how it resonated with you and you, you yeah. really loved the post they made about XYZ. Yeah. And then they reply back and say, well- Hang on two seconds, I'm just gonna put, put this on Zoom. So apologies, that slight yeah. interlude. Um, so Christina, you were saying, okay. uh, make sure that you at least engage on the post that you reference, correct? Yeah, and it doesn't have to be like a well thought out comment because sometimes I'll leave that for later as part of my cadence, yeah. but at least give a reaction to the post yeah. so that it, it's not only amplifying it to your network, right? But it shows them that, okay, you're not just full of smoke in your email. And I have been called, I'm saying this from experience because I literally have been called out on this before. They're like, well, you really liked my post and this is really thoughtful, but you didn't even like it. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, so again, just a quick tip that came to my mind that's, uh, <laughs> before that's, we get off that topic. I think that's, that's completely, um, that, that's completely valid. So uh, with all this uh, in mind then, this is then brought together, in this, this very exciting kind of um, project for you in terms of the um, your outbound uh, FIRE framework, which uh, is on Teachable. I'll add the link to the um, uh, to this podcast and blog and, uh, and so on. So what is what is this, the, this new project, this new venture that you've launched? Yeah, so the Outbound Fire Framework came as a result of just my experimentation and sheer passion for cold email outreach and, and specifically doing it differently than what anyone else is talking about on the market really right now. Um, and so what I do is I really break down this entire framework. And again, it, it's kind of equal parts mindset shift and behavior change. Yep as well as the execution piece and really running through exactly what those steps look like and what the content looks like at each step. So I basically go for all of that. The reason I did the mindset shift in the beginning is because again, most of us aren't thinking that way. And yeah. so there's a little bit of that behavior switch that needs to go off in the beginning. And mm -hmm. so what the framework stands for, so FIRE stands for something, it's fixed right? So fix your mindset yep. and really your mindset around what a sales email should and could look like. Yep. Um, I is for imagine. So imagining yourself in your prospect shoes, what would get you to respond, right? Nobody, everybody says this, but nobody actually really does it, right? about it. <laughs> nobody does it. You get emails and you're like, did you really imagine yourself <laughs> in my shoes? Um, R is for research, which to me arguably is the most important critical aspect and the key differentiator between a okay sales email, a poor sales email, and a really good one. Yeah. So we go over a whole section of research and then execution, which is obviously everyone's favorite part, is putting it into action and what those action steps look like. So it's a framework that's worked. It's kept me from having to pick up the phone, which I'm very thankful for because that's not my forte. Yeah. Um, and really, I'm trying to get everybody to start seeing that 80% plus open rate and 30% reply rate mm -hmm. and 10% booked meeting rate should be more of a baseline for yeah. success. So the old quali it. quality over quantity um, argument, which you know I'm, I'm a yeah. massive proponent of, do less for more, right? Um, Absolutely. And uh, who's your who's the intended uh, audience? Anyone who is either in some sort of sales development capacity or responsible for running their own outbound, mm -hmm. right? Um, which most most of us have to do at least some portion of outbound, right? Um, and also recruiting, recruiting teams, right? Recruiting teams who, um, more external recruiting teams that need to do both business and candidate development. Yeah. This could be very relevant to them as well uh, and doing that differently, yeah. Awesome. And um, so, how many hours investment with somebody once they signed up to your um, uh, to your to your course? Sent you the payment, of course. Um, nothing in life comes for free. How many hours of uh, investment is this going to re require over you know however long? Listen, 
from the course per perspective, it is a little less than three hours and cool. it's broken up into no more than like 25 minute videos. Awesome. That's very digestible and actionable. Yeah. And then you get the entire template nice. structure. So all the text, everything is broken down into documents so that you can use it. As far as applying it, I usually coach people to do, you know, a test of 50 to 100 prospects, mm -hmm. and then they can reach out to me. We can talk about how we can tweak it for their use case, et cetera. Sure. But yeah, I'd say a three, uh, almost a three hour initial investment for the course. Perfect, mm -hmm. that, sounds, uh, that sounds great. I'll be uh, checking that out for, uh, for sure. Um, so to end, avocados, what's the deal? It's very random because, um, you know, with, and this is going to go back to COVID, which I hate talking about at this point. Um, you know, at the beginning, we all needed to start doing Zoom meetings. I was still in sales at that time. And so, you know, here I am getting on Zoom meetings a whole lot more with demos. And it was an icebreaker for me. And so when I found out that Canva, which I know you use too, had these virtual backgrounds that were super playful, I was like, you know what, let me check these out. And I really liked this one, right. which was really weird and random. So for but those it, that are listening, when I, has avocados as a background. For those <laughs> that are listening can't see this, yes. he has avocados as her background. <laughs> it's my background and it has become my signature, which is really, really just, I don't know, it's really weird. But now any Zoom I get on, people expect to see the avocados and those who know, know. Yeah. Now, you know, I know. Um, now, now I know. It's uh, you love avocados. Now you know. awesome. And I think it's that you know, it's having that that unique selling point. It's having that which makes you different and stand out for you know for, for everybody else. And I'm I'm a huge proponent of you know all of that. Back to the business to human. We're all humans at the end of the, end of the day. Yeah. We all have good days and bad days, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today's a good day because I'm talking to um, uh, to you. Um, that has been super um, insightful, super awesome, and. I mean, there's a lot of super there, so I apologize. Um, where can people uh, where can people find you? Hey, listen, I live and breathe on LinkedIn. Okay. So, um, Christina Finsep, you can find me. You'll see avocados probably in my picture. <laughs> I just changed it out. Um, I did have like the whole like suit jacket. Uh, I was like, man, I need to change my picture. That is so not me anymore. Uh, it doesn't really give a true representation of my personality. But if you've gotten to a page that has avocados, it's the right chances way. are it's probably me. It's so, probably you. Yeah. I will put I will put the links to your LinkedIn profile um, on this, along with the links to your. Um, uh, your course, highly recommend everybody should check that out and uh, sign up to it. If you've listened to this, if you enjoyed it and you reach out to Christina, please do mention um, this uh, this podcast or this uh, this vlog. Um, otherwise, Christina, I'll probably see you very shortly on Discord and the chaos and the insanity that is happening over um, uh, over there. Those that know, know. Those that don't, well, you'll have to find, you have to figure it out for yourselves. Um, but thank you. I really, really do appreciate your time and insights to um, uh, today. It's been uh, it's been great. And um, to everybody listening, as always, thank you very much. If you want to be on the podcast, reach out to me. If you want to recommend somebody being on the podcast, uh, reach out to me. But otherwise, have a cracking um, day wherever you may be uh, in the world. But that's enough for me. And bye-bye, Christina. Bye. Thank you.